Well, I want to encourage you this morning. We're going to jump all over the Bible, but we're going to begin in John chapter 6, verse 66. Now, I'm going to read some to you, a passage very familiar to you but from Joshua, but I want you to turn to John chapter 6, verse uh, 66. In Joshua chapter 1, starting in verse 6, God said this, says this, Be strong and courageous. For you shall give these people the possession of the land, which I have swore to their fathers to give to them. God is, and you can't be reminded of this too much, God is the greatest promise keeper. Amen. Verse 7, only be strong and very courageous. Be careful to do according to all the law which Moses, my servant, commands you. Do not turn, refer to the law, do not turn from it to the right or left. So that, see it's conditional, so that you may have success wherever you go. This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night. Be careful to do, all, to do according to all that's written it, for then you will make your ways prosper, and then you will have success. Do you believe in the word of God? Does your life, and I'm, you have to let the Holy Spirit communicate this to you, but in this season of your life, while you've got going on in your life, does your life, your decision, that it, does it back up? I believe in the Word of God. And as James says, my works will reflect my faith. My works, my decisions reflect that I believe strongly in the Word of God. Amen? And, you know, we, you should think about that every time. And you should be able to answer that question every time before you listen to a message or before you're alone by yourself with the Holy Spirit and open your Bible by yourself. Do I believe that whatever's in God's Word is the best thing for me? Because I don't need to open God's Word, no matter what the topic I may be trying to deal with, until I'm able to say, yes, I believe no matter the topic, that God's Word, what it says, is the best thing for me, and therefore that's what I must choose to believe. And that certainly falls into category, why am I a church member at First Baptist Putney in this season of the church's life? Let me ask you a question. Why do you believe most people join the churches they join? Not why do you believe they join church, because most people know why they should join a church. But there's so many, just for example, Southern Baptist churches in Albany and surrounding areas. Why do you believe most people choose to join that particular Southern Baptist church, for example? Some would say, if we're honest, well, it was the closest one to my house. I grew up Southern Baptist, so when I moved to that community, I looked for a Southern Baptist church, for an example, and it was the closest one to my house. Well, that sounds very logical, makes sense, doesn't it? But you know what? That is an unbiblical reason to join that particular church. By the way, before I go any further, let me say this. I believe, on the authority of the Word of God, that one of the greatest lies that we have bought into. Not the only lie, but one of the greatest lies we bought into. It doesn't matter where you go to church, as long as you go to church. But let me tell you, according to the Word of God, God has a detailed will for your life. He has a detailed will. That is, I am just gonna, don't want to sound obnoxious, but just use this as an illustration. That is absurd to believe it doesn't matter where you go to church, as long as you go to church. It's to say it don't matter who you marry as long as you get married. God has a detailed plan for your life. And this is His house. And who He calls to this particular house falls under His detailed plan. Amen? So even though the, house, the church is close to my house, is logical. That may or may not be where God called you. Some would say, well, I joined that particular church because I have small children. And I certainly can relate to that. I mean, goodness, I have a special needs child. So I take all these things into consideration. So we say, well, I have, and they have so much for my children. Well, that just makes sense, doesn't it? Oh, yeah, of course. But do you know that is an unbiblical reason if that's your motivation? 
Because what if, and God certainly does this, God called you to church, your young family, you have young children, and God called you to a small church and they didn't have any children. And you say, well, God, I, the church down the street, they got all kinds of things going on for kids. God, I swear I got to go. What if God called you to be the pioneer to begin a children's ministry? Would God do something radical like that? That's his nature. What if someone say, now here's one that would really bless me. It's the messages I hear. By the way, you don't hear that much anymore. Maybe it's because the messages they hear. I don't know. That sounds so awesome. And you know what? I would, I would smile to hear that. But you know, that is an unbiblical reason. What is a biblical reason why I join that particular church. There's only one good reason according to God. Because God called me there. Oh, other churches has one different bells I like over here. This church over here has got different whistles I like over here. I wish my church had. But you know what? It's not about the music. And I think we have good music. But that's the, and some people join because of music. That's an unbiblical reason. The only reason you join, the only reason you leave a church is because God called me. Amen? We, make, we use even church membership. Where are we going to join the church? We use selfish motives, self-focused motives. Why we join that particular church? Amen? Oh, they're logical. They make sense. We get people to agree with me. Oh, I would, if I was in your shoes, I'd do the same thing. But God Almighty doesn't agree with those, those motives. God agrees with one mode and said, God called me. I'm here because God called me. Because let me tell you something as a preacher, but I've been in your shoes as a layman sitting in church. There's going to be times where you just easily love church, and there's going to be times when it's not. And you better know when it's hard, I, if nothing else, I know God's called me here. You better always at least have that to hold on to when it's not easy. And there'll be times, even in a good family, and when it's not easy. When it don't feel good. And everything about your flesh said, let's go down the road somewhere else. But you better know, and it better mean something, God called me. Amen? Billy Graham says that 80%, in his opinion, 80% of churchgoers are lost. Probably because he sees a lot of decisions made out of self-focus. Rather than biblical, where the Bible leads them. Matter of fact, Henry Blackaby says this we choose churches like we would choose internet providers. What's in it for me? Who's got, out of the different providers, pay from, who's got the best package for me? It didn't work like that with the Lord. The first, I only have two points this morning. The first point I want to talk to you about being a self focused member. In John chapter 6, in verse 66, says this, As a result of this, many of his, being Christ, many of Christ's disciples withdrew. Uh-oh, that's never a good sign. Remember the word disciples mean follower. So as a result, many of those who are in the habit of following Christ, the word of God said, withdrew, and were, ne were not walking with him anymore. So that wasn't just a seasonal withdrawal. That was a decision that they never went back to change. Why do you think they got there? How in the world did followers of Christ, those in the habit of following Jesus, how in the world did they get to a point where they would withdraw and never follow Him again? I can answer that question and so can you. They took their eyes off Christ and they put those eyes directly on themselves. And guess what? You and I are not more spiritual or not more whatever than they are. If we take our eyes off Christ, it's a slow process. It's a drift away. It's usually not a just cut right off the uh, one time slice and move away. It's a slow pull away. But we are no different if we take our eyes off Christ and His purpose of why He called us. Here then that drifting process has already begun. 
And you, my friend, may be further down that road of drifting than further down than you realize. But by the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, and by His grace only, you can choose to turn back. To come back to Him. To return to Him. Repent of that self-focused sin. And say, Christ, forgive me. Nobody yet has realized. I had not gotten so far that anybody else picked up on it. But Christ, you have. And you've revealed it to me. And I'm ready to come home. Are you homesick for the fellowship with the Lord? Amen? A self-focused member. This would be a person that would rather talk about the church. Maybe whine, complain, than talk about what the Bible says. Let's listen to what James, Jesus' half-brother, the, he becomes after he sees the resurrected Christ, he becomes the pastor of the church of Jerusalem. Let's see what he says about the tongue. In James chapter 3, starting in verse 6, And the tongue is a fire, the very world of iniquity. The tongue is set among our members as that which defiles the entire body and sets on fire the course of our life and is set on fire by hell, the Bible says. For every species, now listen to this interesting observation, verse 7, every species of beast and birds of reptiles, creatures of the sea is tamed and has been tamed by the human race. But no one can tame the tongue. It is restless, evil, full of deadly poison. How? You can't tame the tongue. It's impossible. You know why? Because the tongue is just a tool. What rolls off the tongue is the heart. You can't tame the tongue. It does what is on, it says what is on the heart. And if the heart's not right, it's going to roll off the tongue. Things that are not pleasing to God. When the heart is right, you still have to tame the tongue. It's just going to roll off the tongue the things that honor God. Amen? And that's why we don't... When we, the tongue is actually a, a sign from God, a little spirit, how to do spiritual inventory. How are me and God doing? Well, what's coming out of your mouth? Because that lets you know where your heart is, what your heart's focused on. Amen? And when we are self-focused, I don't like the lights in the church. It's too bright. It's too loud. It's too this. It's too that. I can't move forward to hear better. I can't because I don't want to. I don't want to do this. I don't want to do that. I, what, what's the common theme there? I, 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 I. What's the common theme for the servant of Christ? Jesus, 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 Jesus. Huge difference between I in Jesus. Amen? And when Jesus has control of my heart, what rolls off my tongue? Jesus. When I have the control of my heart, what rolls off my tongue? I, I, I. When the church is not meeting my wants, as a self-focused member, I want to leave. I want to gripe. I say things that they cover there in the book. The church is full of hypocrites. You know, can I just say something? That's 100% true. And you're part of that hypocrite. I am too. You know, I had someone say to me, you don't practice what you preach. I said, no, man, I'm not Jesus. I mean, I'm not. I, pray, I preach what I feel like the Lord puts on my heart, but I'm not sinless. But just for a little insight, ma'am, neither are you. In the, book, in the book it says this, uh, Pastor, as an illustration, Pastor Roberts, Pastor Robert is just not feeding me anymore. Let me just say something about that. According to the authority of the Word of God, Pastor Roberts, Pastor John, Pastor whoever, Sunday school teacher, whoever, it's not their job to feed you. They weren't called to feed you, they're not equipped to feed you. And you think that whoever preacher on TV feeds you, he's not feeding you either. The Holy Spirit, the Bible says, is a teacher. That's who feeds you. You know, I've had seasons in my life, I didn't get fed, and I put it the blame on so-and-so. But you know what? The blame falls down to two people, and it ain't old brother so-and-so. It's either me or the Holy Spirit. 
And I have never felt comfortable blaming him for anything. But see, that self-focus, I'm not getting fed. And it can't be my sin. It has to be brother so-and-so, sister so-and-so in Sunday school's fault. It must be, you know, that they didn't come visit me every two seconds. All these things. It is a me environment. Now, I pastored uh, uh, a guy, one t- uh, a gentleman one time who's 50 years older than me. And he was, a, he was a de- one of my deacons. And he got very upset with me that how dare I. He had a... A, a meeting call with me and the chairman of the deacon and how dare I I mean, well, I mean you can really fit to hear something terrible I just, I've done how dare I not come visit him for the third time and how dare I try to reach a different, gener- a different culture in that neighborhood when I should be coming to visit him a third time in the first year how dare I think I should go reach them Son, I'm 50 years older than you are. And I said, yes, sir, you are, but you're not as old as the Word of God. That didn't go over well, by the way. <laughs> Why? Because I was trying not to be, not trying to sound spiritual. I was trying to come from what God says, and He was coming from what I want. Those two worlds don't ever see I die. Look at the value that Christ puts on the Bible, I mean, puts on the church. Matthew chapter 16, verse 18, Christ says, And I also say to you that you are called Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades shall not overpower it. That is the power. Jesus said, I'll build my church. There's no room for I when it's his church. And it'll, my church will be so powerful that the gates of Haiti shall not overpower my church. But there's no room for self-focused members in his church. Amen? Amen. And that's where Jesus Christ, that's how he views his church. And when it's his church and we're surrendered to him as his called people to this church, God, Jesus Christ testified the gates of hell can't overpower it. Then how in the world are we losing so much ground in the church? Well, he goes back and he didn't say the church will stand up against the gates of hell. He said, my church will. How do we know? We'll just give a little example. We'll make it about the home. How can we say, my home will stand up against the gates of hell? No, when it's his home. When it's his church. And what is the number one enemy of keeping this to be in his church? Me. The person you see in the mirror is the number one enemy keeping this from being his church. Amen? What does Christ want from his church? 2 Chronicles chapter 7, verse 14. If my people called by my name humble themselves, there goes the me, will humble themselves. Pray, seek my face, turn from their wicked ways, that I will hear from heaven, I will forgive their sins, I will heal their land. They'll start gaining ground. Hell will try to fight back and they will lose that fight. When it's mine. Let me ask you a question. Are you doing your part today? As a member of First Baptist Church of Putnam. Not what you did 10 years ago as a member or two days ago. But today as a member to fight. This will be by the grace and the power of God in me that lives in me as his child. This, I will do my part to make sure this season this will be his church. I will stand on the authority of what God says. I will love because my father is a father of love, but I will not love and separate truth from it. Amen? Are you doing your part to making sure that this is not a self-focused church, but it's his church? Secondly, first we looked at being a self-focused member. Secondly, membership, ladies and gentlemen, is a calling by God. Do you believe if your grandchild got called to Africa to be a missionary, do you believe that would be a calling by God? 
Amen, that would be a calling by God. Do you believe if God called your son to be a pastor, that would be a calling by God? Absolutely that would be a calling by God. If God called him, well, it's just as much as those two statements are true, membership is a calling by God. To be part of where God, he has a detailed will for your life. He has a call, he has a purpose. The Bible says that when you get saved, if you know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, that God Almighty invests in you His Spirit. And in His Spirit, you get spiritual gifts that did not exist in your life before you accepted Christ, your Savior. The Bible says every child of God gets one, some gets more one, no one gets them all. And God called you to take their gift and your gift, and your gift, and your gift, and blend them together, not focus it on myself, but blend them together, united, no matter how old you may be, or how young you may be, but blend them together in this season, together, for the glory of God, and that is His church, and watch out, Satan, what God will do in His church. But you know how He gets the pieces here? He calls them. He calls them here. And that's why I said in the introduction, you have to know that you're called by God is the reason why you joined here. Now yes, it's convenient if you live across the street like Vicky does. Hey, it's close to my house. Absolutely. But that can't be the reason why you're here. Or any other reason other than God called me. Let's listen to what Paul says in Romans chapter 1 verse 1. Romans chapter 1, verse 1, Paul says, I, Paul, a bondservant of Christ. We know that a bondservant is one who chose to give up his rights for Christ. To give up his rights for, for their master. And Paul's saying, I'm choosing because I'm compelled by the love of God. I am choosing to waive my rights for Jesus Christ until he takes me home. Paul says, continue to read. Paul, a bondservant of Christ, called as an apostle, set apart for the gospel of God. Paul says a whole lot about his purpose, his focus in verse 1. He said he's called to be an apostle by who? By God. Listen, what does that mean? That's not my calling. And so I don't need to say, well, my friend, I'll just use me as a pastor, but you use you as a, as a church member. I, my friend, preacher friend over here, he's got it better than I do in this area. God don't want me to look at other grass and see if they're greener or not. Because it's not my calling why I'm here. God's called me. Amen? And I want mama called. I want daddy called. I want tab called. I was Jesus called. That's what Paul's saying there. And you've got to know that you're Jesus called here. And Paul says that not only have I waived my rights and I've been called by God, why well, does he end verse 1 there? He said, set apart for the gospel. He understands his purpose. He understands why, what God's going to use him for. Do you understand why God calls you here? Why he wants to use your gifts for? Do you understand? Doesn't matter if you've been here since the beginning or you've only been here a couple months. None of that matters. If you know Christ, you've got gifts. And why God called you here, he's got a purpose. And what is that purpose? To use you, to be unselfish, and to use you for the gospel of God. But let me tell you something. I probably couldn't hurt my witness of the power of the gospel when I, any more than when I'm focused on me. That's probably the most word I can pour on the power of what the gospel looks like in someone's life. What was that song, the special one's title of that song y'all sang, Vicky? Jesus saved. That's my life. And God's called me here. He's called you here. That's your life. Now God might call you away tomorrow. He might not ever call you away from here. But until He does, according to the Word of God, that's your purpose. Amen? And I'm going to say something in love. And I love everyone. I have a little extra energy. I don't know if it's lack of sleep or what. I have a little extra energy. So don't confuse my enthusiasm for anger. The Bible's made it clear what our purpose is. Amen? Amen? But we get so tripped up, don't we, as church folks, 
on what's not clear in the Bible. We get so irritated, caught up about that. Amen. I mean, what color of the car? I don't like that color. I'm going to pitch a fit about that color. Da, da, da. Where in the Bible they talk about the color of the carpet? Let me ask you, why are you so passionate about that color? When's the last time you told somebody Jesus Christ died for them? Which is very clearly God's purpose for my life. Amen? Oh, we, we get so caught up. I don't like how they're doing it. I don't like this. I don't like it. You can't find your disagreement backed up in Scripture anywhere. But you can find evangelism all through it. As my mentor Manly would say, let's be caught up what is clear in the Bible. Let's pray about the things that aren't clear. Let's trust those who've been entrusted to make those decisions. But things that are clear, let's say I'm all in. Because of the loving God. Because I'm, I'm a simple person. I need a loving God to make it clear what His purpose is for my life. Because I'm not that sharp. I'd miss it if he didn't make it clear. Thank goodness God made it clear. What my purpose is as a member of First Baptist Putney in this season of his life. Amen? Paul didn't have a self-focus. Let's look at, there's many examples in Paul's life. You can look at to express this. But let's look at 2 Corinthians chapter 11. Starting in verse 3. Verse 23, excuse me. Are they servants of Christ? I more so. And far more labor and far more imprisonment. Five times I received from the Jews 39 lessons. You know why he didn't get 40? Because <clears throat> they believe you could live with 39. They believe 40 would put you over. Five times I received 39 lashes from the Jews. Three times I was beaten with rod. Once I was stoned. Uh, once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. A night and a day I have spent the deep. I have been on journeys in danger of rivers, danger of robbers, danger from countrymen, danger from the Gentiles, danger from cities, danger in the wilderness, danger in the sea, danger amongst false brethren. I have been in labor and in hardship through many sleepless nights, in hunger and thirst, often without food and cold. Apart from such extreme things, he's saying, apart from all that, I still have, verse 28 said, apart from all that, there is the daily pressure upon me of concern for all the churches. You never heard where Paul says, about, it's about me. Could it be that's why God used him so much? You know, you read through the Bible, I know you have, and you read through church history, and I'm sure you've looked through church history, the people that God has used in a mighty way, who God has already called home, and yet God's still using their life to produce fruit, to encourage people today, and maybe they died 100 years ago, 500 years ago, 2,000 years ago, are people who had flaws. For people who had disabilities. You got flaws? Are you perfect? No, I don't think you're perfect. I'm not perfect either. I'm a man with flaws. But God uses those people with flaws. Some cases, great flaws. Some cases, great disabilities. Who are all in. That's who God uses. Who aren't saying, it's about me. They say, no, sir, when it was about me, I was heading to hell. I, my gracious God called me and said, listen, you're going to hell about you. Turn to me. And I accepted Christ and I realized through his res uh, revealing to me that it is all about him. John the Baptist says this, said this, I must decrease so that he, being Christ, so that he can increase. Jesus Christ again says this in Matthew 16, 18. And I also say to you that you are Peter, and upon this rock I'll build my church. By the way, if he doesn't build the church and it's not his church, it's not church. Amen. He goes on to say, and the gates of Hades shall not overpower it. <laughs> Jesus says this in Mark 13, Mark chapter 13, starting in verse 32. But of that day and hour no one knows, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, only the Father. Take heed, keep alert. Some translations say keep watch. For you do not know when the point of time is. It is like a man away on his journey, who upon leaving his house and putting his slaves in charge, assign each one a task. 
and commanded the doorkeeper to stay on alert. Therefore, be on alert, for you do not know when the master of the house is coming, whether in the evening, at midnight, at crop crowling, or in the morning. Least he, fi least he come suddenly and finds you sleeping. And what I say to you, I say to all, be on alert. Folks, we don't realize that we have bought the lie that we think we have the luxury of wasting time. But Jesus Christ is telling us, you don't have the luxury of wasting today. How do we waste today? Make it about me. Make it about me. Because as long as you have that attitude, it's about me, you will be caught off guard. You'll be caught with embarrassment and shame because you've allowed yourself to be preoccupied with you instead of being called up with His glory. Let me, let me ask the question to Sunday school teachers. And this applies to everybody. I'm just going to ask them. You do realize that being a Sunday school teacher, A, is a calling. And you realize that B, with that calling, you are more of a Sunday school teacher than one hour a week. Amen? I mean, amen? amen? It is a ministry beyond the 11 or the 10 o'clock hour on Sunday morning. Matter of fact, if that's all we have is the 10 o'clock hour as that ministry, then we don't have really much of a ministry. Amen? amen? And every time I give with the right motive and I serve, Jesus Christ is honored. I show the power of what the gospel can do to how it can change a person's life and I build up for me rewards in heaven. Amen? This is what the Apostle Paul says, Philippians chapter 4, verse 17 to the church of Philippi. Not that I seek the gift itself, because they've been taking care of Paul. He said, no one has taken care of me like you have. He says, not that I seek the gift itself, but I seek for the profit which increases into who is, whose account? Your account. God, every time we give, God takes notice. Every time we choose to be selfish, God takes notice. Are you a giver? You know what some people say? I, actually, I pastored folks like this. They said, you know, that flood of, what was it, 94? When was the big flood? 94. Really, really messed us up. We lost most of our people in flood 94. We just, boy, that flood. I was like, you know, that flood was like 16 years ago. Oh, that flood, that flood. And I said, you know, I don't, I'm sorry, I don't believe the flood messed you up. I would believe it if they weren't people all around these houses, around this church, that God still has here. Now, yeah, the flood changed the culture of the church. And if we invited those people in and they came, it would change even more. But the flood is not why the reason why the attendance is the way they are. Amen? Some will say, well, we had this type of music. We had this type and. I know that somebody would say if we had a different preacher. I, I, I don't even have to ask that question. But that's not, none of those are the reason. The only reason, and I'm not talking about more people because only God knows how many people He'll call this church this season. But I'm talking about being as usable to God as God wants it to be. It's because God, we still struggle with God whose church is going to be. Look at Acts 2. But I, I, I know I'm like you. I am grateful for the Word of God and just let it speak for itself. In Acts chapter 2, starting at verse 42, it says, And they continued to devote themselves to the apostles' teaching. So they were teachable to the Word of God, and to fellowship, and to breaking the bread, and to prayer. Skip down to verse 45. They began selling their uh, property and possession. So they're willing to serve when it costs, to the point it costs. And were sharing them with all as anyone might have need. And day by day, continue with one mind. So this was the church family. This wasn't a Sunday school class. This wasn't a group. This was the church. And day by day, continue with one mind. In the temple, breaking the bread from house to house. 
They were taking their meals together with gladness. So that's a choice of an attitude. With gladness, sincerity of heart, praising God. That's a choice. Having favor with the people. And the Lord was added to the number. Day by day, those be saved. You notice it in Israel. They didn't say anything. And Vicky, nobody said anything really to me. But I have heard this a hundred times throughout my church life. If we only had this type of music, people would come. Well, yeah, but you know, God did it in Acts 2. They didn't mention music. If our church were only located on the other side of town, you notice they didn't mention location of the church? How about the flood? You notice they didn't mention those things. What did that text focus on? Their attitude. And how God blessed their attitude. Amen? It's amazing what God can do. God says, if this is my, I'll build my church, it'll be my church. And the gates of Hades can't stand up, can't overpower it. Are you using your gift to serve God? On an ongoing, consistent basis. By the way, the greatest ministry you have as a member of this season, a member of this church, is ongoing, participating where? The prayer ministry. The prayer ministry. Have you heard me say it? And you'll hear me say it over again. Sunday school teachers, deacons, whatever, whoever, whatever you're on, you don't have a ministry if you don't have a prayer ministry. Because, and we need to be a part of praying. And listen, there are things in our prayer, our prayer time on Wednesday night that are more important than other things. And let me tell you what's the most important. Prayer. We don't need to have a meeting. If we don't have the prayer is the most important thing. Amen? I mean, that's just, that's just basic. Are you using your gifts at, for God's glory? What's, for God's purpose? What's His purpose? Oh, to proclaim the gospel. Paul taught me that. Are we being a little too self-focused rather than His focus? How do I know? Last question, I'm going to ask Vicki to come. How do I know if I'm a self-focused member or a Christ-focused member today. Well, let me ask you this. Does Jesus Christ right now, does He have your best? Are you all in? That's how you answer that. I believe you answer that question. 